My name is Courtney Colson, a female to male to female detransitioner, and on this channel we try to figure out what the hell is wrong with me. On this episode, the carnivore diet. And this is a much requested topic, a lot of people want to know what the carnivore diet is, how it's benefited me, and it's had some tremendous life-changing benefits. But, long story short, and it is a very long story, everything we've ever been told about food is wrong. You don't need carbohydrates. Calories don't matter. Low sodium is dangerous. Uh, cholesterol, we have that all wrong. Don't even get me started on that. And the idea that fruit and vegetables is healthy. It's pure sugar. Meat is bad for you. It's not, and it's definitely not bad for the planet either. But I'll begin by my history. So I grew up in a time of the food pyramid. And I remember in year seven, I had the worst teacher, Mrs. Warner. And she was really sadistic. She would pit the students against each other. She'd be really manipulative and just awful. But the thing that will always stay with me is one time we had this assignment where we had to write down everything we ate for a week. Okay. Then at the end of that week, you came in, swapped your sheet with another student, who would then do all the math and announce to the class whether you were overeating or undereating. Could you imagine if someone did that today? That teacher would be fired. That is horrendous. That would give a kid an eating disorder. It's, a, it's amazing I didn't develop an eating disorder because it felt like society was doing everything in its power to make me that way. So, of course, I ate whatever I wanted, and I was overeating according to this chart or whatever it was we were working from. I should also add, calories don't matter. The macronutrients do. Fat, protein, carbs. Because 2,000 calories of fat are not the same as 2,000 calories of carbs. The only reason we place such emphasis on counting calories at all is because it's what scientists observed first about our metabolism. And when I was eating a high-carb diet, I was constantly hungry, just like everyone else eating that diet. You know, people say, oh, I couldn't possibly fast. Well, yeah, it's because your insulin is always peaking and crashing, so you really feel the fluctuations of hunger. I haven't in years. And it's all based on the food pyramid, which is a total lie. There is no scientific truth to it. In fact, they ignored nutritionists, and it was funded by the, the, the industries that could afford to lobby the hardest. So you have the grain industry, and the Seventh-day Adventists, and you have all the... It's a huge, complicated story, and I won't really go into it, but I'll, I'll focus on my own history. Fat is so crucial, because you can either run on ketones which is when you don't consume any carbs, or glycogen, which is the fuel you get from carbohydrates. And the problem with running on glycogen is that it's an inferior fuel source. You are tapping into your muscles before you're burning fat. That's why you see these obese people who are just losing muscle mass and just getting fatter and fatter because they're not burning any of that fat they're just wasting away all the muscle. And when I was a kid, I ate whatever I wanted, and it was a lot of carbohydrates, and I thought that was being healthy. I, you know, I didn't care about flavor. I ate very plain food, and it was a lot of crackers and pasta and rice, because I thought, oh, you know, it's plain, so that's healthy, right? But when I was a really little kid, I would sneak into the fridge and eat what I thought was butter because my body craved nutrients that it wasn't getting. But it was margarine. Because of course back then my mom thought that was a healthy thing. No, it's hydrogenated oils. It's, it's oils that have been bleached and, and processed within an inch of their lives. And that is the biggest source of illness in the world right now. You know, I'm not someone who says you have to be carnivore. There's no other way. There are very strict militant carnivores. But for me, I say, well, no, it's mostly this processed crap. Don't consume canola oil or peanut oil or sunflower oil. It's all so unnatural. Do you see oil coming out of seeds naturally? No. 
Do you know how much machinery it goes through to look like that? On my 11th birthday, and I've talked about this in other videos, I got gastro. And, you know, it passed at a normal rate or time frame. But then I never seemed to get better in terms of my stomach. I was suddenly so sensitive to, to anything. Eating was a gamble. I had no idea if I was going to feel fine or instantly feel sick. And my mom took to me to all these doctors and they would give me fiber supplements. You know, take more Metamucil, that'll help. It made me way worse. Then they thought I had depression. And then after that, they started to suspect I had autism because I had all the symptoms. At the same time, you know, I'm going through puberty. So, oh, well, she's gone from this very fit, active, outdoorsy kid to this introverted, recluse, uh, emo kid. Well, you know, I guess that's just puberty. It wasn't. And puberty was really difficult because my periods would wipe me out. I was barely functional. I was anemic. I had to take iron supplements. I was, you know, I, I would get my period. And that would last for about uh, a week. And then I'd take about a week to recover. And then sometimes because my immune system was so impacted, I'd get a cold. So then you're basically, there's two weeks trying to get over a, a cold, two weeks trying to get over a period, and then a cold, and then a period. I just had such a miserable time. And it's no wonder that I started to hate my body and not feel connected to it because I was just constantly suffering and no one had any answers. I was just told this is the way I am and then I should live with it. And my mother didn't even suggest birth control. No, no one did. And I, I don't approve of birth control and I don't like it the way it made me feel. But because I was suffering so badly with periods at that time, I kind of feel like, well, it should have at least been discussed. Cut ahead to the age of 21, and I got Barma Forest virus. I was bitten by a mosquito, and I developed chronic fatigue syndrome after that. And it's something that I still suffer with to this day. I'm 30 years old, so it's been nearly 10 years of my life. And I mean, I haven't felt healthy 100% since I was 10 or 11. I've just never fully recovered, and maybe I never will, but... At least through diet, I am gaining a life back again. So, chronic fatigue lasted initially 18 months. And because I was just isolated in bed all the time, when I got better, I felt like, yeah, I've really had a long time to really think. And I've decided I'm actually a man. And so, I do think my, my gut health and my mental health and all that, and physical health, it's all connected. And that's why I started to feel dysphoric, because I just felt so angry and disgusted and hateful towards my body, because it, how dare it trap me within it like this? How dare it steal that 18 months of my life? And he, funny enough, in hindsight, I was actually pretty active still. I mean, I used to be so productive, 100%, just go, 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 all the time, every day, and I was super productive, never stopped, never even watched TV. And then when I got chronic fatigue, it felt like, oh God, how, how does anyone live like this? It's probably about the same as how I feel now. <laughs> um, and so then I began my process of transitioning into a man, and I was bodybuilding, I was taking testosterone, I was feeling great, and they got a cold. I mean, I was pushing myself way too hard. I was doing a lot of different things. I had an assignment due, my librarianship degree. I had all this sewing to do for a photographer. Um, and yeah, I mean, I was basically waking up at 7 a.m. and not stopping till 2 a.m. Then I got a cold and I just never got better. And I got worse and worse and worse. I was in a wheelchair. My mental health really deteriorated. I thought I was a robot at one point. And I couldn't eat at all. I was living in a share house. I'd run away from home because my relationship with my mum was just so bad at that point. And I couldn't eat. I would, and so this was, I was doing, I should mention, I was doing keto at that point, plant-based keto, because I thought, well, you know, you don't want to eat too much meat. It's not healthy for you, right? So it wasn't quite vegan, probably vegetarian, a lot of eggs and stuff, but not a lot of meat. And the keto diet was really helpful 
because before I had gotten sick the second time, I was bodybuilding, as I mentioned, and I was doing the bodybuilding diet, which is a lot of carbs, a huge, it's just crap. It's just a lot of rice and vegetables and low fat chicken with no skin on it. And you're taking these, uh, these protein shakes as well. It's just processed shit. And I wasn't cooking in good oils. It was just canola oil or whatever. I think I was doing olive oil at least. But yeah, I started gaining a lot of weight. Because I was taking testosterone, I had chronic fatigue syndrome, I wasn't bodybuilding anymore, I wasn't exercising. So I thought, well, gee, well, how do I stop this? Because if you stop exercising, your body starts burning up the muscle instead of fat. Turns out, if you're in ketosis, that's not the case. In fact, I still have abs now and I don't really exercise. I was now in ketosis and burning fat preserving the muscle without any effort. And, you know, you see all these these Avengers or, you know, the, the Hollywood actors and they have to do these in, insane workouts and diet uh, routines. It just, it's just superstitious. It's, it has no logic. Well, it's a, oh, yeah, I've got to eat um, every half an hour and it's got to be um, carbs at this time and fat towards the end of the day and protein at this and this quantity at this. Just eat meat. It's that simple. It really isn't that complicated. Do you think our ancestors... Were, mm, hang on. Okay, we've got a perfectly good zebra here, but... Uh, okay, so we've got to wait two more hours, and then we've got to... No, no one's counting calories. You just eat until you're satisfied. It's The problem is the modern world and processed food. It really is. That's what's making us all sick. And... Well, focusing on myself, I'll get into the science later on. It's hard to focus because it's just, it's just so much. But towards the end of, of my keto career, the run there, um, I just couldn't eat at all. I would get, I'd have acid reflux constantly. I would take a few bites of food and I would just bloat out. And I felt like I couldn't eat anymore, even though I've only eaten, you know, maybe that much food. I, I smelt like a corpse. I was constantly farting. I had to get my housemate to go and get me some uh, degas medication because it was, it was so embarrassing. It wouldn't stop. And I was unintentionally doing one meal a day because I would eat a little bit and that was it. For the next 24 hours, I would be suffering. It would go in one end, out the other. I wasn't throwing up and I've been vomit free since 2003, as I've mentioned before. But yeah, it was really getting to that point where I thought that I would have to go into some kind of care facility, go into hospital, because how do you just live without consuming any nutrients at all? You can't do that. There's, there's a finite amount of time you can do that. And that's when I found out about the carnivore diet. I was listening to Joe Rogan, and around that time, he had on Michaela Peterson and then Jordan Peterson, and they're both carnivores, and they both talked about how it was just such a miracle cure for them for arthritis and depression and all these other things. And I had a hard time listening to it because I just thought, well, that doesn't make any That can't be possible. But what about this? What about, what about vitamin C? What about fiber? All these things I've been told. But they made very logical, rational arguments, and then I figured, well... I'm dying. I am literally dying. I can't eat properly anymore. I'm in constant pain. What have I got to lose? And so I ordered in these groceries, and it's funny, the guy who delivered it, because I wasn't well enough to leave the house, the guy who delivered it said, do you have dogs? Is that what this is all for? No, that's all me. <laughs> and it was all this organ meat, and you know, I'd done all my research, and I said, yeah, you definitely want to have organ meat and all that. And the first thing I ate was chicken hearts. And I took a bite, I didn't bloat out, I kept eating, and I ate so much, I was oh my god, it's like my, my brain's come to life for, for the first time in ages, I feel alive, I felt so good, I, better than any drug you could ever take, it was just such an intense feeling of, of healing, <laughs> that my body could finally eat food and had been starved for so long. And I, I look back at photos there, and I do look sick. I don't look anorexic or anything, but yeah, I did not look well. And 
suddenly I felt alive again and I could eat comfortably. And within a week, I was out of that wheelchair. I went grocery shopping by myself on my own two feet. And that sounds impossible. That sounds insane. But you are what you eat. It is so important to eat as our ancestors did. And I'm all about ancestral living. Whether you're big on carnivore or not, I don't think it's essential. But we have to acknowledge that we are still naked apes who didn't leave the jungle that long ago. And so that's why I'm a big proponent of fasting. And to this day, I only do one meal a day. And, you know, even a 16, eight hour fast, that's still pretty good. Some days I do two meals, can be hormone related, or maybe I'm just being very active that day. But for the most part, you know, 27 days out of 30, it's probably one meal a day. I don't feel hungry otherwise. And that's the other thing too, we have this horrible relationship with hunger. We think it's a really bad thing that we should eat immediately because what's going to happen? There's nothing. It's not a bad thing at all. Human beings are not rabbits. So rabbits can die from something called ileus, where they're constantly having to keep their digestive system going. That's why they're constantly chewing. If they stop, they get ileus, their gut seizes up, and they die. Human beings aren't like that. We are hunter-gatherers. We go long stretches of time without finding prey. We don't have to constantly eat. We don't. We didn't have fridges. We weren't carrying around. We weren't dragging fridges along with us to store food to instantly eat it. We didn't have snack bars or whatever. No, our ancestors could go days or weeks without food. And that's how we naturally evolved. And that's the same thing. I like the Wim Hof method, the cold showers, because our ancestors, again, didn't have air conditioning. We got uncomfortable. And we need that. Uh, red light therapy is another thing I swear by, which helps with your circadian rhythms. Red light replicates what it feels like to be looking at the sun at sunrise or sunset, which I cycle to work at sunrise anyway. So there's also that. I sleep so well now, especially with the blue blocking glasses that I put on at night. But going back to diet, I stuck to carnivore and never looked back. I I don't really miss what I used to eat. I mean, sometimes there's a few things here and there, and I have been able to reintroduce a few things, but recently I tried reintroducing olives. No. Tomatoes I can, especially if I grow them myself, especially if I dehydrate them. So, yeah. Our ancestors fermented a lot of things, they dehydrated a lot of things, so that's another thing we have to take into account. Um, but yes, <laughs> focusing on my own journey, I my health got better and better. I mean, I was still taking testosterone, so I still had a lot of fatigue, I uh, still had a lot of neuroses and stuff, but I seemed to be more functional, I was still housebound but not bedbound. I could get up and do a few things. And then about a year into the carnivore diet, the most unexpected thing happened. I didn't have autism anymore. And that's a very controversial thing. And I have another video that goes into more depth. But we don't know much about autism. And I've talked to actual autism researchers and they agree. Although autistic people on the internet will scream and shout at me, oh no, we know everything. Really? Then why are we investing so much money into autism research? For shits and giggles? Don't think so. But I had all those symptoms, but they came on later in life when I was about 11 or 12. And then they went away. And sure, I'll probably always be an eccentric weirdo, and that's just the way I grew up for a lot of my life. But I'm noticing a lot of that's going away. I used to be quite geeky and into pop culture and all that. Not so much anymore. I don't really care about comic books and movies and all that the same way I used to. It's just not the same. Uh, it used to be my whole world. But more importantly, what really makes someone autistic is not your personality, as a lot of people seem to assume. It's sensory issues and it's social issues. I can look people in the eye, no worries. I have no issues understanding tone of voice, uh, sarcasm, any of those things. And the sensory issues, I don't need to wear earplugs to the movies. I can go without wearing sunglasses. I 
don't have issues touching certain textures. I have no problem with hugs or physical affection. All of that's gone. All the things... I used to have to wear uh, headphones on the bus and listen to music, otherwise I was too overwhelmed. No, I used to be so anxious. You know, I didn't really have emotions, but there was this low-level anxiety about uh, sensory stuff at all times. I was kind of on edge. But I started to develop emotions. I was just coming to life as a normal adult human woman for the first time ever. And it was, actually was only just the other week that I had an emotional response to food. Generally, I don't really care. It's more about, oh man, there's a steak with my name on it because I'm real hungry and I want, you know, nutrients. But I just suddenly felt nostalgic for these chili tuna sandwiches that my mom and I used to eat all the time. And obviously, tuna is full of mercury, so you shouldn't eat it too often. And bread's very bad for you. But I was like, I'm gonna try and make my own version. I made my own carnival version when uh, I'll show you how I make breads and pastas and stuff. But it's basically just cheese and egg and ricotta and what have you. And I bit into it, and I was just, oh wow, God, that takes me back. Oh wow, and I just had this really strong emotional response. And this is all because I corrected my diet. That's really all I was missing. Was eating the things that were appropriate for my body. And I think gastro made me sensitive to plants initially, and I didn't realize it for a long time. And doctors kept prescribing more and more medication to deal with my symptoms without looking at what's actually causing this. And doctors aren't taught anything about nutrition. Not at all. It is not part of their curriculum. So they just prescribe things to treat the symptoms. Diabetes, you can cure that. Type 1 and type 2. And it's so frustrating to listen to friends talk about either their own diabetes or their child's diabetes. And you don't have to jab them with needles every day. You could just not consume carbs because that's what it comes down to. Don't put more insulin in. You want to stabilize your insulin. And the best way to do that is fasting or keto or carnivore or anything like that. Do you think our ancestors had diabetes? No. What do you think it came from? And so where our health really started to spiral out of control is the 1970s when they introduced, especially the Americans, and actually Sweden, as much as I love Sweden, they kind of made a mistake here. Yeah, they made a food pyramid. And especially the American one, it had white bread and processed grains and crap right down the bottom as the biggest serving of the day. 11 servings a day? How does that work? And then right up the top is, well, okay, there's junk food and stuff. But then almost all the way up the top is meat and dairy, the most nutrient-dense, healthy food in the world. Sorry, what? And after that, obesity rapidly skyrocketed. So I don't think that's working. It speaks for itself. But where did that come from? Why did we start thinking that was healthy and why did no one question it? Well, that's a big long story and I'll get into that now. So we'll talk about, but where did they come from? How did we get to where we are now and why did we believe this was the best way to eat? People still believe this is the best way to eat. So we'll get into that now. I've talked about my own experiences and the miracle cure of the carnivore diet. It's just, it's incredible. I can't describe to you how amazing it is. And I recommend everyone give it a go themselves. But if you're going to do keto or carnival, the most important thing I have to tell you is these diets are suitable for every human being on the face of the earth. Except if you have a thyroid condition, those people can't go into ketosis. But you could definitely eat more ancestrally, paleo, that kind of thing. The one thing that people make a mistake on is electrolytes. So if you've gone from a high carb diet to a low carb one, what I recommend is taking it easy, slowly adjusting, slowly cutting things out, and add a lot of salt to things. Add salt to your water while you're fasting, if that's what you're doing. Because otherwise, you are going to feel like you have the flu, keto flu. You're going to have diarrhea, you're going to feel nauseous, you're going to think, I cannot do this, how does anyone live like, oh, it's the worst, oh, that's not true. Uh, you'll also have keto breath, maybe, you might have bad breath. I didn't get any of the bad symptoms, I think, because I very incrementally went into these things and did all my research, but 
Now I'm going to go into the whole history of, of human beings and how we started eating and how things changed due to religion, governments, bad science. And I'm going to cut it here because I have to go to a driving lesson now. But uh, So if I come back and things look different, that's why. And back. It's about four hours later, I think. I went into the city to do another driving lesson. And then I briefly went into the library to do some research on one of my novels. Perhaps a movie script. I don't know. I'm full of ideas. So, where were we? The dawn of man. That's right, we're going all the way back. Our early ancestors were herbivores, and they nearly went extinct because of this. Food became so scarce that they would have died. But as fate, fortune, luck, god, evolution would have it, these ancestors of ours converted to carnivorism or omnivorism. So they were able to hunt meat and eat it. But, and this is what makes humans very interesting, we can't hunt with our claws. We don't have any teeth. Not much to talk about there either. We use tools. And that, these are the two most crucial things about human beings. We eat meat, and we use tools to gather that meat. And that is so bizarre and fascinating, and that's what makes human beings so wonderful and... and well, the only one of our kind. Well, except maybe Neanderthal and Australopithecus. and We had a lot of competition back in the day. But what I'm saying is, those franchises, they all died out. Humanity's still going strong. Destroying the planet, but still going strong. <laughs> so we were meat eaters. We were hunter-gatherers. We primarily ate, uh, I don't know, I'd say 80% of our diet was meat. And then, seasonally available fruits and vegetables. And you got to take into account, fruits and vegetables weren't like what they are today. You know, we've bred them to have a lot of flesh, a lot of fruit, the edible part, the, the, the juicy bits. You know, back then, you know, just skinny little roots and fruits with big seeds, they weren't particularly appealing. Until we got to agriculture, but we're not quite there yet. So, yeah, you'd be eating what was available in your environment. There were no, there's no refrigeration. There's no truck bringing you in some imports from another country. It's whatever's right available in front of you. And then we got to agriculture. And agriculture is a good thing. You know, there's, there's something called um, soil reclamation. And this is the beautiful symbiosis between crops and ruminant animals. So humanity had a pretty good thing going there. We would till the soil and make our crops and, and get our food from that. And then the ruminant animals would go through and they would leave their manure, they would till the soil, and it was very rich soil, very healthy soil. And during this time period, we were having very little impact on the environment. We weren't taking up too much of other species' environments to create these crops. It was a perfect system. And agriculture has gotten us through a lot of tough times. I think a lot of carnivores act like, oh, we should never have vegetables at all. Mm, no. Calm down. You need both. You need a balance. Only a Sith Lord deals in absolutes. So... We have grains that we harvest and store, and they store very, very well. And so humans figure out how to make bread. And it's pretty tasty from what I remember. And the thing with bread is that, or any grain-based foods, is that they are very carb-loaded. They are very high in carbs, same with rice, same with... Uh, well, any other grain you can think of. And when food is scarce, a high-carb diet is fine because you're eating whatever is available. And you also have to take into account the way we used to make... Let's use bread as an example. 
we didn't have wheat as we have it today. We've actually bred it to be smaller and easier to get through a harvester. Back then, it was a kind of wheat called einkorn, very low in gluten. And also, we tended to ferment everything. So we were having sourdough. The bread our ancestors were consuming thousands of years ago is absolutely not what we are eating now, especially the stuff you buy in store that has all the preservatives and all of that. So there is some truth to, you know, brown bread and sourdough. They are healthier. But human beings are not good at digesting fiber, and they can't really extract the nutrients from fruits and vegetables very well. We can a little bit, but I would argue we're not true omnivores. We need more meat than we need vegetables. The vegetables and the fruits aren't really keeping us alive. I mean, that's why people can be vegetarians for a very long time, because they're still consuming dairy and eggs. That's the nutrients. That's where all the, the, the stuff that keeps them alive is, the, the fuel. The fruits and vegetables, they're tasty. They can be enjoyable, so I'm told. <laughs> but you will die if that's all you eat. And you see that with vegans over and over again. They get very ill and they have to take supplements and there are no supplements in the wild. Do you think a vegan would last more than a few weeks at most in the wild? I don't think so. So things were pretty good for a long time there. Then the Industrial Revolution happened and people moved into cities in greater and greater numbers and it was harder to import meat into the cities without it expiring before it gets there. So there was this idea that, oh, you should limit your meat intake. Meat is associated with, with bad behavior and, and all that. Well, yeah, people are getting sick mentally and physically from eating rotten food. No shit. But there wasn't really an all-out assault on meat. Um, people were up until the mid 20th century, regularly consuming organ meats, bone broth, the stuff that keeps us strong and smart and healthy and productive. And then something changed in the 1970s. And it's not just America, you know, normally America gets all the blame, but it was actually uh, in Sweden, they came up with these dietary guidelines, and it was the food pyramid as we recognize it today. But it it had grains and, and carbs down the bottom and the meat up the top. And just going back a little bit, a reason why that may have been is we've still got two villains here. Ansel Keys and Sanitarium, or the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So, cereal, cornflakes, the health food of a nation, no, it's made specifically to curb your masturbation. And that's all, it, the Seventh-day Adventists, they, they, they're, it's a, it's a vegetarian religion, and so, which is ironic, because they're Christian, and the Bible's like, Oh, if something shady going on, just slaughter a lamb, put the blood over the top of your door, you'll be fine. <laughs> a lot of, lot of animal murder. Sometimes child murder, too. Hmm. Anyway, so Ansel Keys is not related to the Seventh-day Adventist or, or Sanitarium. I don't know what his motivation was, but he wanted to conduct a study to see if fat caused heart disease. And so he did this survey across the world, and the data said, no, fat doesn't give you heart disease. But Ansel decided, I don't like that answer, so I'm going to falsify the data and perpetuate a lie that is still alive and pretty damn strong to this day, nearly a century later. So that's where we're coming from, where we think that cereal, low-fat, slave food, essentially, is good for us. But you could have, I mean, they, they did ignore the actual health officials when they were making these food pyramids. They, they did have to actually ignore the experts. I mean, you could see this throughout history that the ancient Egyptians, you know, the pharaohs, you would imagine, oh, they're so jacked and they're just godly. No. They got bitch tits. They got little pot bellies because all they do is lie, lounge around all day and eat 
grains and bread and all the fun things. And you can see this with the gladiators as well. The, the vegans love to mention the gladiators. Oh, they're these ultimate warriors and all they did was eat grains. Yeah, because it's cheap. It's slave food. Gladiators were basically slaves. I mean, well paid. They were servants, I guess, if you want to get technical there. I digress. They had dad bods. They were not eating the breakfast of champions, let's just say. And that's basically because it's the cheapest stuff to feed people. And that's the, the situation we're in now. The food pyramid was not about optimal health or nutrition. It was about which industries could lobby the hardest and spend the most money to put themselves at whichever point in the food pyramid. So being that Sanitarium and the Seventh-day Adventists had a pretty vested interest, that is why to this day you look on government websites, you look on the World Health Organization website and they say you must eat grains. You must eat lots and lots of carbs. Human beings need carbs for energy. I mean, sure, if you want to lose muscle mass and gain fat, if that's the goal, I guess it's a good idea. That's where you get this thing of skinny fat, where someone has you know, skinny limbs, but they've got a big old pot belly. It's, it's because there's low muscle mass and, and high fat, or bloating. So why are grains bad? I should get into that. Grains aren't bad in moderation when they're fermented, and when they come from iron corn especially. But in the modern world, we manufacture huge quantities of food, and carbs of any kind are sugar. That, that, that's the other deception that they did. They, they pulled this deception of, oh, well, there's sugar, and there's carbs. Two different, no, actually, they metabolize the same in your body. For example, starch, when it interacts with the enzymes on your tongue, and through your digestive system, it converts to, bingo, sugar. So, in moderation, fine. And the Victorians were saying their idea of the food pyramid was basically every food group in moderation. And it's actually not bad. I mean, um, you would be running on glycogen rather than, ke you wouldn't be in ketosis. But, you know, you, you would still be pretty healthy, especially given the kind of diet they would have had back then. So grains are very high in omega-6. So omega-3 is very good. Omega-6, you need very little of it. And if you go through a pharmacy, you'll notice you can buy supplements for omega-3, not 6. And why is that? Well, it's because it's highly inflammatory and very abundant in the modern Western diet, or the standard American diet, the SAD diet, as it's referred to elsewhere. And if you're eating highly inflammatory foods, you will become inflamed. And this might not even be a thing you consciously notice. It's not a, a, an immediate reaction, but you might develop heart disease, high cholesterol, diabetes, arthritis, all illnesses, basically all illnesses have an element of inflammation or inflammation is the root cause. And when you manage the inflammation in your body, whatever ails you, it'll solve it, I swear. And that's why I think everyone, absolutely everyone should, even just for a short period of time, try a paleo diet, try keto, try carnivore, because this modern diet is killing us. We have not evolved to eat this way, and it affects some people more than others. Some people eat absolute garbage, and they never have a complaint. I know people like that. Um, I mean, okay, they have some issues, but not debilitating. And yeah, they're just absolute garbage guts. Just put anything in there and they'll run on that. They're very, very fuel efficient. But for others, you can have these chronic illnesses. I mean, in the case of Michaela Peterson, she had childhood arthritis. She had both of her hips replaced before puberty. Her doctors didn't need to do that. That's so sad that she had to undergo pretty serious surgery at such a young age. And there are so many other people like that, you know, children with diabetes who have to stick themselves with needles every day, and they don't have to. People giving themselves cancer because the doctor said, oh, well, your, your cholesterol's too high, so we'll give you medication for that, which is a carcinogen. 
just, <laughs> it's hard to keep quiet. It makes me really angry. Capitalism and religion have killed millions, if not billions of people, for many reasons, and nutrition is one of them. So, 1970s, you got your food pyramid, and it gets adopted all over the world. And especially in the 90s, which is when I was a child, when I was growing up, that's what I was educated on. And that's what I was told to eat, and I followed it, and I ate very bland foods, and I thought I was being healthy. And I was not. I was suffering, and I lost so many years of my life that I will never get back again. I lost my youth, basically, my childhood, to illness. I was indoors, sick, from about the age of 11 until a couple of years ago. And, I, you know, I, I don't regret my past because I think it brought me to this point and it gives me a very unique insight. But it's just a shame that it was so preventable. And a lot of people out there are still suffering and it's very preventable. So, food pyramid, people start following it. And heart disease goes up, obesity goes up, diabetes goes up. And the government and the food industry blames us. Oh, well, they're clearly not doing it right. You want us to have 11 serves of bread a day. And you're surprised when people are getting sick living like that. So that's a very quick overview of the whole history of human diet. And you can look at hunter-gatherers in the modern world. Or you can see the Australian Aborigines, or the Inuits, or any of those tribes who have since been colonized. And you can see in those early days, when they were just meeting Europeans, they were very lean, very fit, very buff. And then you look at them now, and they're like everyone else, dealing with obesity and all the same diseases brought on by... A Western diet. And thankfully, there are places that are untouched by this mindset. And thankfully, there are untouched tribes around the world who are still hunter gatherers and they live very traditionally. And Fearless and Far is a really good channel, actually. And he goes to all these unusual places and he interviews these people, and it's fascinating. They're so healthy. And they live as human beings have done for thousands of years. And they don't have depression or suicide or allergies or obesity. or <sighs> How can you look at that and look at our modern diet and say, that's fine. We're not doing anything wrong. If not our diet, what is making us so sick? <laughs> so I think that covers a lot of the most fundamentals I will link to a lot of different sources who can cover it a lot better than I can. But I think, yeah, that's the most fundamental information and evidence. I feel like that basically explains everything. It would be hard to argue the stuff I've presented. But hey, it's YouTube, so someone probably will argue with me. But that, that's where you see and that I'm, I'm fascinated arguing with vegans because it really is a sunken cost fallacy it really is a lot of biases this is why it helps to research logical fallacies because you can spot them when they happen in yourself and in other people and so they will argue no humans evolved to eat plants how do you justify that in the archaeological record but that about covers it See Space Cowboys.